Good morning. I have the pleasure to introduce the last plenary session uh, with our, our host, uh, Ernesto Trevigno. He is uh, an uh, associate lecturer in the School of Education of uh, the Pontificia Universidad Católica del Chile. He holds a PhD in education from Harvard University. And his research interests include education inequalities, public policy, uh, policy in education, and citizenship education. I give him uh, the word, and the, um, his keynote, uh, uh, the title is Making the Most of Assessment Data to Improve Educational Opportunities. Thank you very much. Uh, well, good morning. Uh, thank you very much to all. Thank you, Patricia, for the presentation. And Thank you to Imbalsi for the invitation to be here with you today. I, uh, I am going to present uh, a presentation on how we can use uh, large-scale assessment data to study educational opportunities for children in different, different stages of the school system. The, Structure. It's, it's difficult to work if it is turned off, but now it works. So this is the structure of my presentation. I'm going to present several examples on how we can deal with difficult questions regarding educational opportunities. So I'm going to pass through uh, some of pieces of research in a very superficial way, if you wish. But there, there, there are uh, all the citations and the bibliography is in the presentation, which is going to be in here. Uh, first, I would like to uh, talk about the perspectives and rationals of governmental large-scale assessment. Then. Uh, several examples of making the most of assessment data to improve opportunities to end with a couple of lessons on that issue. Well, first, we need to understand that quality and equity of education is composed by several uh, dimensions. We have been uh, channel to think about quality and equity of education basically in terms of the results in standardized tests. But rea in reality, the experience that children and students live are more complex than whatever you can measure in a single cognitive test. When we think about quality and equity of education, actually we are thinking, of course, in a context, and in that context, education's, education takes place. And education is mostly about the processes that the students experience in the school and in the classroom. Also, as part of those processes, the students have trajectories. You know, some, some of them repeat grade and retain in the grade. Some of them drop out, uh, some of them come back, uh, and sometimes we miss that part of the experience of the student. Also, we tend to concentrate when thinking about results on cognitive skills, basically measured through academic tests, standardized tests. But in most of the constitutions of the world, I would bet Italy included, there is a lot of poetry in the Constitution regarding the integral formation of the human being. Social, emotional, physical, civic development, even in some parts, spiritual development is included. And all this combination makes quality and equity. And I would point that here, in this intersection, 
it is when we can call or we can talk about quality and equity of education. Bearing that in mind, please hold with this idea because we are going to go through different uh, places of uh, research. Well, what are the characteristics of large scale governmental assessment? Basically, and I will oversimplify it, please, for the sake of time, but we have high stakes and low stakes assessments, and census in terms of coverage or sample in terms of, in terms of coverage. High stakes could be high stakes for students or could be high stakes for schools. It depends on the system. In Chile, we have a system which is high stakes for schools. Schools are threatened to be closed if they don't reach certain point or of uh, uh, achievement uh, and certain characteristics of achievement among their students. And in general, high stakes uh, uh, assessments are census, are a census in terms of coverage, are standardized, it have, they have several shortcomings. For example, we have a lot of teaching to the test. Uh, teachers are, and schools are often more worried about teaching the topics of the test than producing the integral development of human beings in the classroom. Uh, they like, they lack uh, inclusive modes of, of assessment. For example, we don't have adjustments for uh, people with special needs and uh, they tend to measure only or mainly cognitive academic skills. In terms of strengths, these type of assessments, since they are uh, census, they cover at least a complete cohort of students. They allow us to identify every student and her or his character characteristics. This is because there is not only a test. The test comes with surveys for students, teachers, principals, and families. And, of course, uh, since it is a census, we have the opportunity to enrich data using complementary that data that we researchers can collect and then connect to the large-scale assessment data. Low-stakes assessments, well, many of the international assessments can be regarded as low-stakes. They are mainly uh, sample-based. Of course, they are standardized. They don't cover the, the whole population. They also lack of, of inclusive models, uh, uh, modes of assessment. There are no uh, adjustments for the assessments. And also measure mainly cognitive and academic skills, although there is lately, I would say, in the last, in the previous four or five years, a movement towards including a more, a more complete set of issues such as socio-emotional development. They are very efficient to estimate population traits, and they offer the opportunity to deepen understanding using quanti qualitative methods. And in general, we have had two approaches, uh, or I can see two approaches in terms of using large scale uh, assessment data for research. One is to just focus on the large scale assessment data and do things like schools School efficacy, factors that explain achievement, looking at inequalities, uh, socioeconomic segregation, and other, and other issues. And uh, in that type of research, you never go out of the database of the large scale assessment. But there is an opportunity of use both standardized assessment and complementary data to answer more specific and in depth questions. For example, how social emotional development connects to cognitive development, school practices, 
how are how are school practices and how they affect the different uh, dimensions of student uh, development, family practices, student trajectories, teacher-student interactions, and of course discourses of the different actors in the school community. So once we understand this, I'm going to present several examples of the things we have done in Chile, these examples come from Chile. I need to mention that the Chilean system in terms of assessment system, in terms of coverage, uh, looks very much like the Impalsi, the Italian system. We can connect students to their trajectory from pre-K to uh, university, and we can trace them in schools and classrooms. We cannot match teachers with classrooms, that is more difficult, but we can follow uh, children wherever they go. It, it, it looks like a big, big problem. But there are some, uh, sorry, there are some characteristics of the data that we need to take into account to, to have a thorough research using this data. First, uh, well, it depends on the quality and the scope of the assessment itself, the availability of such, such data for researchers. Sometimes assessment systems are uh, very cautious and protective of the data, and it is very difficult to obtain data in some places. Uh, of course, there is, it makes a huge difference if you have a census or if you have a sample in terms of uh, the scope of the things you can look at. You need flexibility of assessment data to be linked with other information, such as enrollment, student trajectories, and data collected by researchers themselves. There is no doubt that uh, the idea of uh, making the most of large-scale assessment is also linked to the contextual capacities of research and the policies to promote research in each country. And uh, the disposition of policy makers, administrators, schools and teachers, and teachers to help to translate research findings into informed decisions. So a lot of conditions before you can, you can make a change. And now I'm going to go to this one, two, three, four, five, six examples of what we've done. The first example is uh, we, try, we try to understand the sorting of students uh, within the schools. In, in Chile, schools sort students into different classrooms. If you are in classroom A, you're probably at the top of the distribution of achievement. If you are in classroom F, you probably are at the very bottom of the distribution of achievement. And we want to see the relationship with this, with sorting, with achievement, social emotional development, and friendship. Then we will look at educational trajectories, student trajectories from preschool to primary education, and high school student trajectories, also a different way of looking at it, and finally, understanding citizenship among youth in schools. All of this information has used assessment data. All of these pieces of research, sorry, have used assessment data, official assessment data. Well, to understand uh, the relationship between sorting of students and, and achievement, we we were uh, very fortunate that the official data uh, in Chile has the same ID for all, all the students, and we can, as I mentioned, track them from preschool to uh, university. But not only we know their 
a classroom and their school, we know their, their GPA, they know their assessment data in fourth grade, in eighth grade, in tenth grade. We might know the, the results when they enter into the university too, we have a national exam, we can link the results too. We know if they, if they have special needs. So, uh, and we know they have also their socioeconomic status as well as if they have repeated grade or they have to out at some point and then come back. So this is very important because we use a lot of this data to understand the issue of the effect of the student sorting in Chile. In Chile there is no mandatory regulation as in other countries in which you track students by achievement. It is, there is no that the A classroom is marked for honors as in the US I, I think is you go to honors classrooms, you know? Very high level. No. In Chile, this is not mandated. This is only a school practice. And we looked into the high schools. Uh, and we found that 60% of the high schools tracked, sorted students by ability into classroom. Yeah. Without a policy. Of course, these are the high schools that have classroom very great. And we try to understand the effects of this sorting on achievement. And this very clear table shows you the results. Uh, I'm going to explain it a little bit. There are three points here that I, I I want to, to mention. First, when you look at uh, this uh, variable explains if the school sorts students <coughs> by ability into classroom. And we'll, what we found is that those schools that sort students by ability into classroom lost a 10% of a standard deviation on achievement. That's the first question. So 9%, 9% of a standard deviation of achievement. Then we ask, ask ourselves, oh, but who, who is paying for that? So we looked here, SIMSA is the name of the na national test. And we can look here that we have quartiles of SIMSE uh, scores, and we could see here that are the two and third, the second and third quartile who are paying the bill for something. So people, students in the middle of the distribution are losing in terms of achievement. That means that students in the top of the distribution that are supposed to gain and students in the bottom of the distribution that are supposed to gain because of this policy are not gaining. Actually, they are staying the same, but somebody else is paying the bill for this nonsense policy. And we did this also in terms of socioeconomic status quartiles. And the two bottom socioeconomic status quartiles are, the, the, are those who pay the bill if, if you look in, in, into, into socioeconomic status. And something very, very important here in terms of using data is that we were able to have the, this regression is done with uh, 2008 uh, data. But we, we had the 2002 data to control for. Even before the students enter into high school, so there is no uh, bias in terms of being in the same school. This, this, part, this was part of the strategy of the identification strategy that we use to do the estimations. So that, that's the importance of having 
a thorough and, and strong system of assessment, you know, to better understand opportunities. So after that, we started to think, well, maybe we would think, we need to think about social emotional development, but our measures, actually the national assessment system collects some data on social emotional development. But it is high stakes. And so we don't believe that high stakes data in a survey uh, would be uh, not biased. So we uh, started a project to try to understand what was the relationship between sorting and theoretical uh, and social development using the, this idea of the big fish, little pond effect. You know, that you compare to your peers and to peers in other classrooms. We focus on academic self-esteem and self-efficacy. We connect the assessment, national assessment data with data collected by the research team. We compare students in low, high, and heterogeneous ability classrooms. We control for student-teacher interactions. We went to schools, look at the classrooms, use the class protocol to have a, a sense or, or a, 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 sorry, um, to have a mark on how these teachers were interacting with their students and what was the quality of teaching because there is always the sense that when you saw the students you know, in some classroom you have very high uh, quality classes and high ability, and in, in low ability classrooms you have very low quality classes. Right? It didn't was the case. Uh, we had an analytic sample uh, of 35 classrooms, and what we, well, again, we had previous data to connect from the national large scale assessment system to connect with our uh, with our data. Uh, we sent our data, we collected the data, and we sent our data to the Chilean Invalsi. And they basically erased the official uh, identification number and substitute this number for uh, a a uh, mock number which they use and allows you to connect whatever data you have, whatever information you have with enrollment, with special needs, and with all the assessments. Uh, and of course, the socio-emotional scales were liberated as well as the procedures for the estimation of the scales. Now, I, I already said this, and we found this, academic service. Um, this line here uh, represents the high ability classroom. This line here, the gray one, low ability classrooms. And this, the black one, is the heterogeneous classroom. And uh, here we have the academic self-esteem, and here we have the GPA of the students compared to their classroom, to peers in the classroom. And it seems, you know, if you look here, that independently of in which type of classroom you are, if you are below the average of your classroom, you tend to have lower academic self-esteem. But that is without considering the estimation errors. But when you consider estimation errors, <coughs> look. Splitting, sorting students into classroom has very bad effects on academic self-esteem. Actually, the only people that benefit from the splitting are those which are here. In high ability classroom, 
between 50% to, sorry, between half to one standard deviation. They have higher academic self-esteem than the rest. Very interestingly, if you can see here, people in high ability classroom, which is below the mean, has very, very low academic self-esteem. Very much like those students in the low ability classroom, in the lower part of the academic achievement. So, one final. What happens with self-efficacy? When we look at self-efficacy, it's the same, self-efficacy, GPA, and we have the marginal effects here, and we can see, you know, this is heterogeneous classrooms, this is uh, high ability classrooms and low ability classrooms. You know, it seems that there are differences, of course, heterogeneous classrooms seem to be more appropriate for uh, improving self-efficacy, but when you uh, take into account the, the estimation errors, well, you find that there is no difference between low and high ability classrooms. Students in low and high ability classrooms tend to have lower self-esteem than students in heterogeneous classrooms, very much through the whole distribution of GPA. Then we ask, well, is it related, this social-emotional sorting development, is it related with friendship? Because sorting students into classroom by ability may shape the friendship and academic networks of students. And networks may, may improve or worsen the social-emotional development of students. Is there evidence to, the evidence to support such a claim? So we looked at the association between sorting and the friendship and academic networks of the students. We use social network analysis, don't worry about this table, just to mention that we use social network analysis. We work with the, well, a lot of people, but Diego Palacios, a colleague who just finished a PhD in Groningen University, um, Again, we connected with previous data from the system, and these are the findings. In high ability classrooms, students choose as their academic peers high achievers. In high ability classrooms, students tend to avoid uh, to have academic peers with bad behavior. In contrast, in low ability classrooms, students prefer to develop friendships, friendship relationships with the students who show bad behavior, with the funny guy. You, you want to go to, with the funny guy. And there is an association between the academic and friendship networks in high ability, low ability, and heterogeneous classroom. This is to say, your friends and your academic peers tend to match, more or less. Another way to think on research using stand large-scale standardized assessment. We worked in a project called A Good Start. And this was a teacher professional development uh, program on site in schools uh, with two years of duration, you know, like uh, around 12 sessions of training for teachers, a monthly cycle of two to three visits to the classroom to improve teaching. And we follow children for two years, pre-K and K, and use experimental and quasi-experimental designs. Under the premise that high quality preschool experiences would support uh, student development in the future. Opportunities. So we wanted to know what is the effect 
of the program on student achievement in second grade. We used to have, we used to have a, an assessment in second grade, literacy assessment in second grade each year, census. Again, we have our data. We collected the data 2008, 2009, 2010, basically. Uh, and we sent the data to the Chilean in Balsi. They connected all the all the data with the with the national assessment, and we we collect the data, for example, on uh, literacy skills using the Wilcott Munoz uh, uh, battery and applied problems, and also social emotional skills such as self regulation and executive function, and also behavioral problems. We looked into classrooms, videotaping the classroom, looking at the, at the quality of interaction, of the student teacher interactions, and we uh, collect information on socioeconomic status and socio-emotional uh, aspects of mothers, especially depression. And uh, we uh, connected that data with the second grade assessment. Uh, well, we use multi-level models, whatever. But the point is that we were able to find that language in preschool, applied problems, self-regulation, and uh, executive function, and low problem behavior is related to second grade results. And th this was thanks to the possibility of connecting our data with national data. Otherwise, we wouldn't, able, we wouldn't be able to be presenting these findings here. Another example of trajectory, uh, remember that, that we uh, presented about sorting, I presented about sorting at the very beginning? We have very strange ideas. Researchers, we used to have very strange ideas. And one idea was that we had was that a student enters into high school, is classified in A, B, C, or D classroom, and then just follow through a pipeline to the end of high school. And we had a lot of problems with our database. And the problems uh, were related to the turbulence of the trajectories that the students followed during high school. You know, and nobody, no, nobody ever looked at it. Uh, and we, 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 were, we were not thinking in looking at it, uh, but we look at it because our databases didn't match. So we discovered, we then started to think, well, what was the experience of students in their high school trajectory? You know, in, probably in a very numerical way, but in a very human way also. And are there specific groups of students that tend to have more turbulent trajectories? Well, first, this cohort, 2008 to 2012, and we found that 86 86 86 percent of the students have an irregular turbulent trajectory 86 I want to stray to stress 86 <laughs> if you haven't realized not even half of the students have a regular trajectory And what happened? Well, some of them changed school at least once. Some of them changed classrooms. So you, you, were, you were placed in classroom A at the beginning. If you were doing so-so, you might go to B, C, D, E, or F in second grade of high school. So, Schools, this, this is like the, like the Purdue uh, 
perfect model. You know? You're always uh, classifying kids because some issues, sometimes mainly for academic issues, but also for uh, disciplinary issues. 24%, almost 25 repeat rates at this one. And by the end of this period, 34%. 34%. 34% have abandoned high school. One third. And we are worried about whatever things. Just to mention two examples here. Who are the students most likely, for example, to repeat the rate and to drop out. Most likely, those in students in, in schools that sort, which are in the first or, or lowest quantile of GPA. The same, look, 60% of the students in schools that sort are likely to drop out in the lowest quantile of GPA. I really like to work in inclusive education and equity education, and teachers don't believe these figures when I show to them. They don't believe these figures. But then we start talking about it and say, oh, you remember Juanito? Juan was here last year. Where is Juan? Don't know. Okay. One probably is there. It's one of them. And finally, uh, we have been working, as you, you may recall from one of the previous uh, slides, on different outcomes, cognitive, social, emotional development, also citizenship outcomes. And we have found that schools have a very limited influence on civic and citizenship of outcomes of the students. 95% of the variance on citizenship outcomes happens within school. It means that you have the whole country in terms of outcome of citizenship outcomes in a school. Different types of power. And uh, I don't know how it's here in Italy, but in Chile, everybody thinks that schools and civic education would change the world. I'm sorry, they will not. <laughs> According to data, they will not. Probably because we are not doing a proper job. We are not thinking through the problem. We are not putting attention to evidence we put all our hearts into schools, and we are highly motivated, but not very intelligent in terms of understanding the phenomenon. So we use the ICCS data from Chile, and we wanted to study uh, the characteristics of schools that seem to create citizenship identity. We, oh, actually, uh, Diego and Natalia, who are there in the back, a part of the team, built um, school profiles based on student characteristics, expected electoral participation, attitudes <coughs> of the different groups, and civic knowledge. Don't worry about the figure. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it's the real figure, uh, but it's just to point out a sad story. We identified about six to ten schools that were out of this pattern. Their students have very similar identities in some topics. I, I remember, for example, 
one school which which was highly which has very good and open attitudes in general towards homosexuality not seen in the country we wanted to go to that school and see what happens how did you do what are your strategies and so forth and so on i'm sorry the embalsy of Chile didn't allow us to go to the schools. <coughs> because they have an IEA, whatever, agreement of confidentiality that didn't allow researchers to go and visit the schools that may shed light on how to improve attitudes towards diversity and other citizenship outcomes. This is just to say that all the previous examples uh, were successful examples. We had several, several uh, non-successful examples. So, uh, at this one. It's just to point out what we missed in terms of understanding a really important phenomena that would have been very nice to have some information with the situation that we have now in Chile. Finally, well, large-scale assessment is key for understanding educational opportunities for students. Without such data, it would be impossible to know how cumulative inequalities uh, during the student trajectories reduce diminishing opportunities for specific students and groups. A census assessment provides rich data for understanding country, regional, and local patterns. Well, the quality of the assessment, the scope of the data, as well uh, to include teacher and student feature, the possibility to link the assessment with other data, administrative data, uh, is key for answering research questions for disentangling how opportunities shape. The availability of data and flexibility to match research collected data with national assessment data is key also to improve the use of the large scale assessment data and the value of that uh, data in terms of understanding educational phenomena. Of course, of course lo local research capac capacities and collaboration between assessment bodies, researchers, schools and teachers is key. We are more and more and more working with schools and with teachers trying to understand uh, the phenomenon that we are studying, the phenomenon that we are studying. Sometimes we have some crazy uh, ideas from the literature and one goes to the school and there are no crazy ideas, just pure daily life of the schools that shape ways in different, in different forms. And finally, a high stakes assessment, a high stake assessment system may produce resistance toward this type of instrument in the school communities, teacher and students. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ernesto, for the contribution. Very interesting and impressive. Um, we we can start with the question. There is any question for Ernesto? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. You gave us um, a lot of food for thought, really. Uh, really very interesting. I have two questions. Uh, um, I was impressed about uh, who pays for, uh, for the sorting and uh, uh, maybe I'm to, my side is not so good uh, for the data. I saw four kinds of four quartiles. If I'm not wrong, if I could understand, the first one is the highest one and the first one is the lowest one. Okay. And 
how you define sorting and how you detect in your data uh, sorting. Uh, because uh, um, I think it's very relevant. And uh, I would like to ask you if you have uh, uh, some suggestions or considerations about uh, uh, the graphs when we saw uh, that for a certain kind of students, uh, it's very convenient to be sorted. Uh, in, from my perspective, uh, um, of course, the general point of view is not convenient, but for a kind of population, it's extremely convenient. So this is a typical example where general interest and individual interest are not on the same page. And uh, I think it's our duty to make it clear in, in order to avoid it or to, to explain the implication of that. So if you have some consideration about that, then thank you again for your presentation. Well, thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, well. Again, thanks to the richness of the data, uh, we were able to identify the GPA of each student mm -hmm. through all their school trajectory. Mm -hmm. And we were able to use the previous GPA that they have accumulated uh, to measure the sorting. And we used the, the cross call Wallis test to detect if uh, students were distributed into classroom randomly or they were leaned towards low ability or high ability. Uh, it took us a while <laughs> to estimate that for, for the whole system. But uh, it, is possible, it is possible to do it. Uh, and it is possible to do it uh, thanks to the data. Because when you talk to teachers or school, they say, no, we don't, we don't sort. Uh, some of them do, but mostly they don't think they are sorting. Uh, that's one one thing. And the other thing is, um, of course, there are some populations yeah. that might be uh, might require to be sorted. But uh, going beyond the the, the uh, research that we presented and to the international literature. What we have seen in the international literature is that sorting or tracking only works when it, um, when it uh, complies with two or three requirements. It is not complete. I mean, uh, you might be sorted in math or in language, but not in math, in language, science, arts, sports, which you know, put you in a high ability classroom based on pro probably one trait, which is GPA in math or language. So it, it needs to be localized in the area that a student needs much more support. And, and that means more support for high achievers or low achievers. In the case of low achievers, uh, it has to be also temporary. You, you sort the student to provide support. And you have a plan, and that plan has goals, and those goals have, have deadlines. And you need to achieve those goals within those deadlines. Otherwise, what you are doing is pretending that you will support those students, but at the end, those students remain in the lower track. You, you, you are not doing the pedagogical job. Uh, I would say those are the two key issues that, for example, in Chile, they don't exist. So in other, in other like in Finland, in other countries, they, they do manage to have more flexibility in terms of organization. In Chile, they, it doesn't work that way. And, and what you are doing, basically, is you are condemning, uh, for example, low achieving kids uh, to, low, to be low achievers forever because they don't receive enough support. There are any questions? No question. Angela? Only an information, an information. Independently of the sorting of the students, in the high school, the curriculum is the same 
or it is different from a school to another. Very good question. Thank you very much. Um, yes, we have in Chile we have a academic curriculum and technical professional curriculum. Ninety-nine percent of the schools are either academic or either vocational. And in reality, students are tracked when they choose the school, the type of school. And then within the school, the school sort kids. You know, uh, and that, that, that was part of our identification strategy, not to confound the two. That's why we picked uh, uh, students in first grade of high school, because in that way we already know in which type of, of uh, school they are. But even in, in te technical vocational schools, there is a lot of sorting, you know. For example, in the north of Chile, copper mining, co you know, ma technician in mining is for the highest achievers. And secretary, commercial, whatever, for lowest achievers. So uh, we try to clean that, but, but very good question. You know? we, we, we mixed the two types of schools there. Christina. Thank you for this inspiring presentation. I'm interested in uh, your study on preschool effects on uh, second grade uh, achievement. And I would like you to elaborate a little bit more on um, how you assessed preschool children when, and if you can elaborate more on the, on the measures that you have. Uh, this is a project in which we have been working since 2008 to date. Um, and the, the research design entitled uh, first uh, an experimental design, the first wave, we have been through five waves already. Uh, and this, this was the more thorough or complete, so I'm going to base my answer in, in that. We collected data in at the beginning of preschool, of pre-kinder, sorry, pre-K, at the end of pre-K, same school year, and then at the end of kinder. What data we collected? We collected ages data hmm? <coughs> from four to six. Okay. Mm -hmm. so okay, sorry, sorry. Thank you for the for the clarification. Yeah, it's four to six. These, uh, these preschools are attached to primary schools in Chile. Uh, and we follow uh, the kids. We measure social emotional development, executive function, and uh, literacy and math three times. Uh, beginning of pre-K, four years, five years, and six years, more or less. Uh, and we follow children. We also measure uh, teacher-student interactions in pre at, at the beginning of pre-K, the end of pre-K, and the end of K. Uh, with class. Um, we also measure uh, the socioeconomic status of the families and some of the characteristics of the families. Uh, to understand, because the depression is uh, widespread in Chile, and maternal depression has a huge link with uh, with, with child development. Uh, so we measure that too, uh, and we measure attendance. I forgot to mention we measure attendance, and I would say that the first study, in the first study, the most impressive result that we had is that two thirds of the children in preschool in Chile uh, were chronic, were in chronic absenteeism. They were not in school, two-thirds were not in school 
around two months or more per year. So it is very difficult with that level of absenteeism to have any effect of any program. And we, we were able to detect that around two weeks of this absenteeism were related to some type of sickness. And the rest was because it was cold, because it was better to stay at home. We also detect that uh, doctors in the public system, uh, when, when mothers went to the public system, uh, we have a very good uh, statistic systems for, for um, winter, winter diseases. Uh, and, they, and doctors suggested mothers not to send their kids to school when the when the epidemic was coming, you know, and so the, the social services were uh, fighting to each other. And just let me remind you that all the funding that schools receive in Chile is based on attendance of the children. So it also created a big uh, damage in ter in terms of financial resources. So a lack of coordination of policies, you know, which makes sense in terms of, the, of what doctors were thinking, <laughs> but not in terms of, of what uh, schools were suffering. I think we, we can finish. Thank you, Professor Trevino, for your contribution.